Okay, so um, tonight I will talk about Assyria um, based on a recent book that Kyle already kindly mentioned, and here it is, and I promise you this is the last moment of shameless self-promotion I'll be engaged on. From here on, I will actually talk about the topic of the book, which is ancient Assyria. I've given quite a few lectures on Assyria based on the book over the past year, and I often try to tailor those uh, lectures, some virtual and some in person, to the uh, respective audiences. For instance, I, I gave um, a lecture at the New York Military Affairs Symposium a few months ago, where I talked especially about the Syrian uh, military and um, Syrian uh, armies and things like that. Uh, given that tonight, um, I'm giving this lecture at a public library, you might expect me to talk specifically perhaps about uh, those aspects of a certain civilization that relate to culture, literary culture, and perhaps even the famous libraries of Ashurbanipal, of which you see here, uh, Tablet and the king himself who founded them, the first universal library in world history. But then uh, I thought, well, um, people uh, are patrons of, of public libraries, not because they're interested in libraries uh, necessarily, but because they're interested in all sorts of different things. And therefore, um, what I'm planning to do instead is rather give you a basic overview of uh, Assyrian history from the beginning to the end. Uh, we're focusing perhaps on a few specific topics, some things in the book that are new and so on and uh, so forth. Um, I don't expect that... Um, Many of you know a lot about ancient Assyria and don't feel bad about it. No one really does know much about it. Um, it's not an empire popular as, let's say, the Roman or even the Persian Empire. But as I claim, my book is the first empire in uh, world history and not only for that reason kind of relevant. Um, if you know anything about Assyria, you will probably know something about this very imperial phase when Assyria is this huge uh, kingdom uh, that rules from uh, everything from from the western Zagros Mountains in 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 Iran uh, to the Mediterranean to the eastern Mediterranean at some point even Egypt when it is an autocratic state uh, very much militaristic in outlook uh, expansionist and so on and so forth this is the image um, of Assyria also in later tradition especially in um, Roman and Greek historiography and also in the Hebrew Bible, some of you may know some of these stories from the Bible about Sennacherib attacking Jerusalem, for instance, and things like that. And I will eventually talk about Assyria in this imperial phase, essentially the late 8th and 7th centuries BCE. But one thing actually quite exciting and interesting about Assyrian civilization is that Assyria actually undergoes uh, a number of major metamorphoses uh, and transformations. It uh, isn't that it's this expansionist militaristic entity at the very beginning already. Um, and um, therefore, what I would like to do is, is talk a little bit about uh, the earlier history of Assyria first, actually spend some time on it to show how uh, things actually change over time, how massively they do change. Of course, also acknowledging that there are certain aspects of a certain civilization, the language, the religion, and so on, that actually remain in place over hundreds, if not thousands of years. When we look at the beginnings, um, of course, we, we face the problem uh, that every historian faces who looks for beginnings. Um, where to find those beginnings is hard to say. When we study tradition, uh, then we see that the Bible in Genesis 10 claimed that Syria was founded by either Nimrod or Arshur, depending how one translates the Hebrew here in this line. Uh, the Greeks claim that it was founded by a king named Ninus. Um, the Assyrians themselves in the Syrian king list from the uh, 7th century BCE uh, ascribed uh, the founding of, of royalty, at least in Assyria, to a certain to Dia. But all these traditions are actually inaccurate. Nimrod and Ninus are uh, figures who were invented and did not really exist as historical personalities. To Dia was actually not an Assyrian, but an Amorite nomad. And so we actually have to look elsewhere. And when we look at beginnings, we first have to look at archaeology, uh, because obviously written sources uh, are available only for much later times. Um, and here, um, the, the area that would later morph into Assyria is actually quite important for the early history of mankind from very early onwards. So already roughly 70,000 BCE, there are uh, traces of Neanderthal um, humanoids uh, in eastern Assyria, 
uh, so in the Western Zagros Mountains, about, about here or so. And uh, the area that later becomes a series is also playing a crucial role in what has been dubbed by uh, scholars uh, the Neolithic Revolution, the period when, um, well, when 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 herding when when um, hunting morphed into herding, and foraging morphed into uh, farming. When you have the first settlements, when people begin to cultivate grain. Um, such as wheat and barley, uh, when the domesticated animals like uh, goats and sheep and cows and so on. This happens around 10,000 BCE. It's, of course, connected to uh, a development where people become uh, sedentary, where they live in small villages that eventually turned into towns. And this, this very significant, very important uh, moment in world history um, takes place for the first time in the so-called Fertile Crescent, which is um, indicated here by this other crooked red line on this slide, uh, a crescent-shaped um, line that uh, reaches from, from what's modern Israel along the uh, Taurus Mountains in Turkey to the western Zagros, and it includes Syria on the upper Tigris near to the modern city of Mosul, uh, where some of these uh, key settlements from the Neolithic age are actually located. The Neolithic Revolution, the so-called Neolithic Revolution, the term is a little bit misleading because this was, of course, a long-term process, is 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 eventually um, uh, succeeded by, well, another uh, civilizational uh, revolution, namely the so-called urban revolution, um, where for the first time we have major cities and eventually also the emergence of writing, of uh, uh, a division of labor on a large scale and, and the organization of, of statehood um, and so on and so forth. This is a development uh, not so much um, connected to Assyria, though, but rather we are still here in modern Iraq, uh, rather to the um, southern areas of Iraq, especially to the city of Uruk, which you may, some of you may know as the city of the famous uh, uh, hero Gilgamesh from Babylonian literature, Uruk in southern Iraq, where in the mid fourth millennium also uh, writing is invented, where the city becomes a major uh, settlement of maybe as many as 60,000 people uh, around 3000 or so BCE, and whose culture then um, actually uh, is absorbed and adopted um, all along the Euphrates River and the Tigris River further north, uh, even in areas far away in Iran and in Syria, uh, and also to a certain extent in Assyria. This is the beginning of an indebtedness of Assyria to the Babylonian south, especially in cultural terms, that remains one of the most defining, of the defining um, features of, of Assyrian statehood. From Assyria itself, though, the earliest really uh, relevant um, his archaeological traces pertaining to, well, what we might define as early Assyrians, uh, go back to a somewhat later period, namely roughly 2500 BCE, and they're connected to the city of Ashur, which here is seen on the left, uh, surrounded by this red circle, with excavations on the right by the Germans um, in the early 20th century BCE. Uh, this very city, as you can see right away when you look at the name, um, is actually the city of the, which Assyria got its name. Mat Ashur, or the land of Ashur, is how the Assyrians called their land, the land of Assyria. But at the very beginning, there is probably no such land. There is just the city-state of Ashur. Uh, and another important feature of that city-state is that uh, the name Ashur is also given to the uh, main deity of this place, the god Ashur. So the city and the god essentially are identical, and uh, later on the land is called Ashur as well. Uh, all this is characteristic for the Assyrian religious and eventually also for the Assyrian political uh, identity and a very important feature, uh, if you wish. Um, from Ashur itself, uh, from roughly 2500 BCE, as I mentioned, we have some archaeological evidence. Um, here on the left, you have an overview of Ashur as it uh, was known from later periods with the temple of the god Ashur actually on the very top um, of uh, this slide, a number of additional temples further uh, to the west. Uh, the one temple excavated um, that yielded uh, most information about these earlier periods is actually not the Ashur temple, but rather the temple of the goddess Ishtar, 
uh, which is located over over here. You can see it there. Um, dedicated to the goddess, yeah, excavations, and on that site in 2001, in which I participated myself, um, dedicated to a, a goddess, a female deity named Ishtar, goddess of love and war, who, like Ashur, was very important for uh, the religious culture of, of Ashur and, and later on also of Assyria in general. So various uh, Ishtar-like deities were worshipped also in other later uh, important centers of Assyrian culture, such as Nineveh and uh, and and and, and uh, Arbela, um, and you can see here on the right that uh, various temples uh, dedicated to Ishtar were built one atop the other throughout the centuries and millennia. From these earliest layers of that very temple, we have a number of uh, interesting artifacts. These altar models on the left, for example, but especially these figurines, one of which. Uh, made of stone, actually fairly small, some 50 centimeters high or so. One of which you can see here on the right, a figurine of a woman, actually somewhat Sumerian style. So the, the style of, of this figure is clearly informed by Southern models. Um, this is a woman, um, and she's presented like uh, 60 or so uh, similar additional statues in an act of praying. Uh, statues like that were placed on benches that stood along the main sanctuary of the Ishtar temple in a gesture of eternal prayer to the deities, thus guaranteeing that uh, the individuals represented by these statues would constantly be um, in possession of divine, uh, well, uh, favor. Um, and of course, one thing that's interesting is that among these very early figurines of Assyrian citizens, if you wish, uh, are quite a few women. So we learn a lot about how these women wanted to represent themselves from this very evidence. Um, we also uh, have from about this time, slightly later, our earliest uh, written records in a cuneiform, the writing system that was in use in ancient Mesopotamia, both in the south and in the north indicating that the language spoken at this time was a Semitic language, probably really an early version of uh, Assyrian, which is a language related to the Babylonian language of the South, and as a Semitic language also related to Hebrew and Arabic uh, languages still spoken today. Uh, some of the early rulers mentioned in these texts, are Titi and Sarikum, were probably ruling in Ashur on behalf of the much more powerful kingdoms of the Babylonians, of the Mesopotamian South, the Akkad kingdom and the kingdom of the third dynasty of Ur. Um, but at some point, um, those rulers uh, of Ashur actually gained uh, independence for the uh, city-state of Ashur. And this may have happened under a king by the name of Tzilulu or Tzulili, who's Seal is represented uh, on the right. This is a really important, uh, uh, it's, it's actually not the seal, it's the seal impression that's uh, here on the right, and that's uh, what is known from tablets. What you can see here is this very king himself, Tsilulu, ruler perhaps rather than king, I should say, trampling upon uh, the body of a defeated enemy, um, perhaps indicating uh, that Tsilulu had gained independence for Ashur through warfare. And then there's an inscription in which uh, this Tsilulu, uh, among other things, acknowledges that kingship in Ashur is actually not his, but rather that of the god Ashur. So, and that's very important for uh, Assyrian civilization that uh, basically there's, a, oh, you might almost say, a theocratic um, there's a theocratic idea behind power in Ashur. The idea is that the actual king of Ashur is not uh, some uh, human being, but rather the god Ashur himself. Um, Tilulu, though, is not acknowledged in later historiography in Assyria as the founder of the um, first hereditary dynasty, if, for which we have a significant amount of information. Uh, that instead is a certain Puzo Ashur, must have ruled around 2000 BCE. And with this Puzo Ashur begins what modern scholars have dubbed uh, the Old Assyrian period. Here you have a quick overview of the main periods of Assyrian history. And you see that after this early period, there are basically three main periods, the Old, the Middle Assyrian, the Neo-Assyrian period. And I will give you in the following minutes um, some information on each of these periods and how Assyrian um, identity and uh, political structure uh, uh, of Assyria uh, changed throughout uh, this very uh, history. It was, of course, a long history of some uh, 1,500 years or so. Um, 
So when we look at the old Assyrian period, um, the time between roughly 2000 with the reign of Uzzah, uh, Asha I and uh, 1700 BCE or so, the first thing that is really quite striking, uh, and this is based on the textual evidence we have, is that there is no actual king in Ashur. And that's, of course, a really uh, substantial difference from, well, the, the Assyria of the imperial period, which is which is ruled autocratically with the king being uh, virtually all-powerful. There is a dynasty of hereditary rulers, but these rulers are not allowed to call themselves king. The word uh, would have been Shavom, and that's a title used all over Mesopotamia elsewhere, especially in the Mesopotamian south, not in Assyria. They, they have other titles. And they also not rule on the, uh, uh, alone. They have to share power with two additional institutions. Uh, one is the city assembly. That's an assembly of the free male citizens of uh, Ashur. And the city assembly is in charge, for example, of, of legal affairs. Uh, it also promulgates law and things like that, uh, makes some important decisions. Um, and then there's another institution that's the limo official, as it is called within the Syrian term, who is the head of the so-called city hall, uh, which is in charge of weight and measures, taxation and other economic issues. So what we can say is that uh, fundamentally at the very beginning, uh, Ashur is not a monarchy. You could rather describe it uh, with a, a term um, initially uh, coined by um, classical uh, political theorists like Aristotle and uh, Polybius, call it a mixed constitution, which has a monarchical, uh, aristocratic, and also democratic elements. And that's, of course, really quite remarkable and gives the lie to these uh, ideas based on Hegel's philosophy that uh, the the East has always been despotic, uh, ruled by one man, and 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 all this stuff. So it's not quite that simple. Um, another uh, important thing is that uh, uh, Ashur is still a city state. We can't really talk of uh, Syria land. That Ashur is not engaged in warfare uh, during this period. Again. Great contrast to later times when it becomes very belligerent. Instead, uh, Ashur uh, is engaged in long distance trade and um, its wealth comes from this very trade. Here you have a, a slide that uh, gives you an idea of the of the trade routes that the Assyrian merchants uh, used. Uh, they traded in particular with a, a recent region in central. Uh, Anatolia, where uh, they lived in a city named Kanesh, modern Kultepe, here uh, marked by this red uh, circle, uh, where these merchants had their own houses, lived in, 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 in a quarter dedicated to themselves, there's a certain degree of legal autonomy. Um, this is a sketch of how these houses might have looked like. Um, and from Kanesh, not really from Ashur, from which we still have actually not too many clay tablets inscribed in cuneiform, but from Karnish we have some 24,000 or so clay tablets inscribed in cuneiform with documents um, that illuminate in particular the kind of trade that these merchants were engaged in, but also their, let's say, social and family lives. We learn about the women of Asho, for instance, and the fact that the merchants, when they were abroad for years, were allowed to marry a local woman whom they had to leave behind her when they returned to Asher and things like that. A really fascinating, uh, well, group of sources uh, that, among other things, illuminates how this long distance trade the uh, Assyrians were engaged in at the time actually worked. Uh, so what happened was that uh, the people in Asher would import tin from the east, probably from, from Afghanistan and some other places, and textiles from Babylonia, but also the women of Asher in particular, would also produce textiles of their own. And then they would sell the tin and the textiles in Karnesh after having brought them with donkey caravans to that city, some 1,000 kilometers or so, uh, northwest of Ashur, they would sell these things in Karnesh for silver, which they would bring back to Ashur, and, and the whole thing would produce uh, an enormous profit. So this essentially is the way um, the uh, people of Ashur make their money at the time. Um, again, very different from, well, uh, from, 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 from uh, the way it works later on. This period, this old Assyrian period, as we call it, with this long distance trade comes to an end, as I mentioned before, around 1700 or so BCE. 
Under circumstances that aren't really quite clear, they probably have to do with uh, the rise of the Hittites in the European kingdom in uh, central Anatolia, in the course of which the uh, city of Karnesh seems to be destroyed. This is the end of these uh, of these trade emporia that the Assyrians uh, had had used before. And uh, then there's essentially sort of a dark age. We know very little about what actually really happens in Ashur and uh, around Ashur between 1700 and, say, 1400 BCE. But when the dust settles eventually, around 1400, when sources become more uh, abundant again, uh, what we can see is that, uh, well, it's a very different scene. Um, Ashur has morphed into Assyria. It's now a territorial state. And you can see this here when this is later, uh, perhaps 1200 or so, uh, when um, this territorial state uh, dominated areas as far away as the Bali River and essentially even the regions of up to the Euphrates in the west. Uh, it had expanded to the north, included now cities like Nineveh, which would become an emblematic Assyrian uh, city and eventually its capital in later times. Um, in the east, the city of Arbela is now part of Assyria, um, modern Arbil in uh, eastern Iraq. Um, even towards the south, uh, the state has expanded. So it's a very different geopolitical entity. Um, all this is being brought about by a number of uh, energetic and uh, ruthless kings. And so now, in fact, these guys are kings. They're no longer just uh, figures who who call themselves with different titles. They uh, very proudly um, adopt the title that um, other great kings in the area uh, were bearing as well. Um, among them, perhaps the first really important one is Asher Obalit, uh, who was in the mid 14th century BCE. I spare you the names of the others. Um, uh, this Asher Obalit is known, among other things, from a letter he wrote to the Egyptian pharaoh, probably Amenophis III, uh, in Egypt. The letter was found at Tel El Amarna, the famous site in central Egypt, uh, that has yielded not only uh, many artifacts related to the to the, to the famous um, Pharaoh Akhenaten, but also an archive of cuneiform tablets um, that, that provided uh, the international correspondence between the great kings of that age. Uh, so interestingly enough, uh, the kings of that time, including uh, the Egyptian kings, communicated with each other in cuneiform using the Babylonian and sometimes the Assyrian language. And in this very letter by Ashur Balit I, uh, you can see that the Assyrian ruler calls himself king of Assyria and even great king, which means he considers himself an equal of the Assyrian, of, of the Egyptian king, also the Babylonian and the Hittite king, all of them great kings as well. Um, and then he uh, asks Pharaoh for gold, which he claims is plentiful in Egypt as dirt, which he says he needs for building a palace. And that is also interesting because the, in old Assyrian times, it seems these hereditary rulers didn't have a palace yet, and they certainly had no corridors, so there were no chief cupbearers and all this stuff. Um, they probably had no harems. They were, to some extent, just simply premium inter powers, uh, and that's really not changing. So um, we have now a situation where the Assyrian ruler is a great king and uh, becomes an almost autocratic figure. Um, and um, still, though, um, there still remains in place this idea that uh, Ashur, the gods, uh, is king of Assyria as well. So this notion that there is now a human being who is king, but the god Ashur is king as well, is something that defines Assyria throughout its history up to the very end. The, see that in the middle Assyrian coronation ritual from about this very time, um, which where, where the high priest of Ashur calls out on the occasion of the coronation of the Assyrian king, Ashur is king, Ashur is king. And then he says something else to the king in the name of the God, which is also quite interesting. He says to him, expand your land with your just scepter. So here we have a, a divine command to the Assyrian king um, to um, enhance and expand the territory of the Assyrian state by military might. And that is now the big another big transformation that takes place in the Assyrian times. Syria becomes this belligerent militaristic power that uh, actually expands through uh, sending armies in all directions and, and fighting quite ruthlessly anyone who opposes this very expansion of Assyria. So this is, uh, we see as sort of 
aspirational imperialism, even though no empire yet exists. Uh, I think a Middle Eastern state can't be called an empire yet for that. It's simply too small. Um, anyway, um, there is no this territorial state, uh, and it um, is very powerful and and um, one of the dominating dominating kingdoms in the area for several hundred years. But then comes a crisis. It's one of several crises that uh, punctuate uh, Syrian history, and I will talk about a few others um, in a moment. Uh, the one that ensues, uh, so beginning in the 12th century BCE, um, has been linked to events in the Eastern Mediterranean that in uh, popular imagination are often con connected to the so-called sea peoples. These are uh, these boat people depicted here on a relief from Medinet Habud, Thebes in Egypt, who arrive out of the blue uh, on the coast of the Eastern Mediterranean, destroy the city of Ugarit, for instance, but also uh, in the upper, uh, on, 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 on the Nile River, uh, can be defeated by the Egyptians, but only just barely. Um, no, it's not just that there are these sea peoples, there are all sorts of other things that seem to be go, go wrong. Um, one important factor at place is probably actually climate change, greater aridity during this time that leads to all sorts of of additional problems. At any rate, what you can see is that uh, many cities in the Eastern Mediterranean, of course, also the uh, Mycenaean centers and so on in the Mediterranean itself, um, the Hittite Empire uh, with the capital at uh, Hattusha in central Anatolia, all these places are destroyed and eliminated, essentially. Um, and Assyria is initially not so much affected by all of this, probably because the, well, the center of the storm is further uh, west, but eventually it is actually affected. So um, around 1100, we see two seemingly contradictory things. On one hand, there is an Assyrian king, Tiglapilius I, who uh, actually marches with his armies to the eastern Mediterranean and washes his weapons in the sea, as he says in his own inscriptions. This looks like Assyria is actually profiting from the chaos uh, by expanding again. But then at the same time, we see that things are not quite as rosy as it may seem because we have a chronicle sort of rather objectively saying what's really going on at this time. And this chronicle tells us that one of those new ethnic groups that emerge at this very moment in history um, and, and now sort of call the shots, they include among others, of course, also the Hebrews um, and the Arabs uh, for that matter, uh, namely, in the case of Assyria, the Arameans, semi-nomads who now move eastwards, wreak havoc in the Assyrian core area. Uh, and you can re uh, read here in this chronicle that they plunder the crops of Assyria, conquered and uh, took many fortified Assyrian cities, that people, the Assyrian people that is fled to the mountains, and so on and so forth. So things look really very dark. The harvest of Assyria is ruined. And in fact, for the time between 1050 and 950 BCE, we have hardly any sources. And later, uh, Syrian texts talk about this period as one of, of complete chaos. Um, so this really is a dark moment in Assyrian history, but it's not the end of Assyrian history. Somehow, um, the Assyrian royal dynasty, which uh, is always uh, the same family, is quite, uh, quite striking for, for about 1,000 years. Uh, the Assyrian dynasty survives and the core area of Assyria, including the city of Ashur, is also not ever fully conquered by those Arameans. And so when around 950, the Aramean threat slowly comes to an end, among other things, due to the fact that the Arameans now begin to settle themselves, um, Ashur is actually in a position to engage in a campaign of reconquest. Uh, which you can fundamentally follow on this very map. We see different uh, shadows of of, of uh, the color shadows. You can see that initially uh, this 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 pink um, area uh, is is this very small area that was left with the Assyrian dynasty maybe around 950, and then uh, though within the next 150 years or so, uh, the Assyrians managed to reconquer what they had lost uh, during. Uh, after the Middle Eastern period. The kings who do this, when you look here at this list, again, not important that you memorize any of these names, but we can see is they're all the second of that name or the third or so, so Ashur II, Ashur II, the second, 
mm-hmm. uh, and so on. They take up the names of famous Middle Eastern forebears, clearly with the intention, these are actually throne names and not birth names, clearly with the intention to follow in the footsteps of these earlier rulers and reconquer the um, areas that uh, those very earlier rulers um, had ruled. Um, and they succeed in this endeavor. Uh, they're helped in this uh, probably by the fact that this period of aridity that begins around 1200 now comes to an end. It is followed by what uh, scholars have recently dubbed the Assyrian Mega Pluvial, so a period of uh, substantially increased rainfall beginning around 925, leading, of course, again to richer harvests than before. And one thing that the Assyrian kings of this time do, uh, a king by the name of uh, Ashurnasir II, in particular in the mid 9th century BC, is that they uh, actually move uh, the capital, the seat of uh, the royal court, they moved away from Ashur to a new city to the city of of Nimrud, ancient Kalhu, where uh, they build a number of massive palaces and temples. You can see this here when you look at the scale. This is a very large. Um, Probably, uh, among other things, because uh, they didn't really have much space in in Ashur to build such large uh, palaces, Uh, but perhaps also because those kings wanted to get rid of 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 the um, or wanted wanted to do de- wanted that the, the the power of the of the local aristocracy in Asha would diminish. They wanted to call the shots really on their own. Um, in Kalach, we also find for the first times certain types of artwork that become emblematic for Assyrian art. If you have ever been to the uh, Metropolitan Museum in in New York or the British Museum in London or the Louvre in Paris, you know that these. Uh, also start slabs uh, with uh, beautiful sculptures of uh, with with mythological or or, or military scenes um, are very typical for Assyrian art. So this is one you can see the traces of color, these black hair and these black beards. Um, and yeah, we've recently made an uh, attempt to reconstruct the color scheme uh, based on chemical analyses of of such reliefs. You can see this on the right. Um, of course, also emblematic for Assyrian art are these massive, gigantic bull colossi, some 50 tons or so uh, in in weight. Um, these are actually not from Kala, but from Durasharukin, later Assyrian capital. Um, you can see here these are hybrid creatures with the body of a bull, a human head, uh, the wings of bird, and, and sometimes even the scales of fish. Um, essentially creatures the Assyrians believed existed in primeval times, when a differentiation to various species hadn't really yet taken place, and that's, of course, enormously powerful. They were therefore stationed in the gates of Assyrian palaces and temples to protect those against intruders. Um, And you see them here really in this majestic elegance that characterizes some of these figurines. Not quite so nice, perhaps, is this uh, little artifact actually from Kalach, from the reign of Shamanesa III, possibly, uh, it chose a metal brazier. The king would sit next to it in winter time with uh, a fire uh, light, lightening up in, in its center. And what you can see when you look clear, carefully uh, is that this brazier is actually in the form of a city, of uh, a city with towers. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the king would look at an enemy's city set on fire while uh, spending some quality time in winter, a rather gruesome scene uh, when one tries to imagine that that does tell us something, though, about the militaristic outlook that the Assyrians had by now adopted uh, at this very time. To show you uh, something a little bit more uplifting again, at the same time, of course, uh, there is artwork of, of great quality, jewelry and so on, and this golden crown found in a tomb of an Assyrian queen um, in 1990 by Iraqi archaeologists, is one of the most spectacular finds from those tombs, but not by far the only one. Uh, that this is a treasure that rivals, um, I would say, uh, what was found in the tomb of uh, Tut and Ramun in Egypt, but isn't very widely known because um, after 1990 came the first Gulf War and then the uh, treasure from Kalach had to be placed into the Iraqi Central Bank and it's never really been properly uh, exhibited. Um, so, roughly, 
by the time of the Shamanese of the third, the mid ninth century, Syria has um, reconquered the lost territories uh, and is now actually also beginning to expand beyond those areas into uh, well, areas west of the Euphrates River, for example, without yet an annexing those areas. And it seems when you look at the Assyrian king list, this is an excerpt here from the Assyrian king list, uh, with these kings, one ruling after another, as if after Tishlamaneser the third, everything goes on nicely and in the way uh, it, it used to go on before. But this is a slightly misleading picture because um, the period in question here, the period between 820, uh, let's say, and 745 is another kind of crisis-like area uh, era for the crown in particular, because the kings are now no longer fully in charge. Instead, a number of high-ranking administrators, especially uh, military governors and generals, seem to have taken over power. Not that they usurped the throne, but they are the ones who really call the shots now. They begin to write their own inscriptions, as here, this one, uh, probably by a general named Diane Usher from the last years of Shamanese. Uh, there's also members of the royal family who have now started to usurp power from the kings, uh, most importantly, Queen Samuramat, the model for the legendary Queen Semiramis, uh, known from, from classical sources and Greek historians and so on. The kings themselves um, sort of fade away a little bit and, and play second fiddle. It's not so clear well, whether that was really bad for Syria, because of course this uh, rise of independent men who, who were very much interested in enhancing the productivity of agriculture in the areas they controlled might also be conceived of as being actually advantageous for the Syrian, uh, for the Assyrian state. But it is quite clear that at least the last 20 years or so of this period were a period of crisis. Uh, we have a document called the Assyrian Eponym Chronicle, which lists uh, major uh, events for each individual year. And when you look at this document, you can see that uh, between 740, uh, 765 and uh, 745, um, there are lots of rebellions and the Assyrian army stays in the land. It doesn't go on campaign, clear sign that things are not going well. Why is that? What's really going on here? Um, well, first, what I should say is we see also, and that's something actually new in the book, uh, I was quite proud to have figured that out. We can see that uh, at some point there's even a rebel king who takes over power, a certain Tiglat Pileser, uh, who is in charge in Ashur in the ancient capital uh, in the years 763 and 762, um, in a moment when there was also solar eclipse, um, an eclipse that took place in 763, and such eclipses were deemed to be extremely inauspicious even celestial events, probably indicating that yeah there might be a break in the dynasty and so on, and that would certainly have in it encouraged this usurper king to take uh, power for a little while. So things are really not going back uh, well political stability is 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 uh, compromised um and what's the root cause for this uh probably something quite familiar to us uh, from the past years um no one wants to hear about it anymore but uh, there we are namely plague um the eponym chronicle indicates that both in 765 and 759 exactly during these years of chaos there was plague in assyria and I think this plague and all the consequences of it with, uh, well, cities being shut down and economic uh, output decreasing would have uh, certainly added to a sense of despair um, and so on and so forth. Now, normally, of course, in the wake of plague, what you expect is, um, well, chaos and defeat. And there's a nice book by Karl Harper um, on the fate of Rome where the author argues that uh, three major plagues uh, in late antiquity contributed decisively to the fall of the Roman Empire. The strange thing in Assyria, though, is that when these uh, 20 years of chaos are over, what follows is not decline, but rather instead the rise to power of Assyria in unprecedented ways. It's now only that I've argued in my book, that Assyria actually becomes an actual empire. And this happens under the new king who takes over in 745, a king named Tiglapileza III, uh, who uh, right away from the very beginning uh, engages on uh, a large campaign of, of conquering additional territories uh, and uh, annexing them, and just uh, not, not just uh, trying to uh, retrieve a tribute, but really annexing them. And um, by the way, by, in this way, eventually more than doubling the size of the Assyrian kingdom. You can see here uh, the kingdom finally indeed 
seventh century at the time of its greatest expansion. Um, here is a definition of what empire is. I am going to go into detail, but it's obviously a play a, a large political body ruling about ter over territories outside its original borders with a central power and an extensive periphery and characterized by a great deal of uh, ethnic, cultural, and religious diversity. All these criteria, I think, apply to the Assyria of Tiglapileza III. Here's an overview of the eventually some 70 or so provinces of Assyria. Uh, so this is the time in the wake of these plagues where Assyria becomes this great empire. And I would argue, I've argued in the book, that uh, this happens because the Stigapileza adapts to the plagues. He uh, essentially compensates the loss of life and wealth um, that he had suffered by means of um, conquering foreign lands, uh, extracting their wealth, and deporting large numbers of people. Assyria now reaches the apex of its militaristic uh, activities, um, which you find illustrated on numerous uh, reliefs from Assyrian palaces, most famously perhaps those from Lachish. Again, I have to be quick here, uh, but you can see here the Assyrian army attacking that very city with uh, people believing it on the right, uh, the Assyrian king um, further right uh, receiving tribute and so on. Here's the Assyrian uh, military camp. This is another scene from the very same reliefs. Here's the site of Lachish. Lachish is a site near Jerusalem. This was the campaign of 701 under Sennacherib, which also led to an attack on the city of Jerusalem that actually failed. Jerusalem was not conquered, but Lachish was conquered. And evidence for that also comes from archaeology in the form, among other things, of these arrow hats the Syrian air arrows that were shot at the city at that very time. So you have a lot of information and, and evidence for these warlike activities and also for the deportation of large numbers of civilians from the conquered uh, areas. Uh, again, here from Lachish, this is these women and children being deported. Uh, and these deportations would change forever the ethno-linguistic makeup of the uh, Near East. This is uh, all very significant. Some several hundreds of thousands of people probably were deported during this time. The period following Shamaneza the uh, Tigrapila the third, um, this imperial period is enormously well illustrated uh, or, or documented. We have tons of sources. Um, we know a ton about kings like Sargon the second and Sennacherib, the uh, among the successors of Tigrapila the third, but time prevents me from providing you as much information here you have uh, a picture of uh, sargon and and its crown prince and akrab Sennacherib is important because under him um, the city of nineveh is made assyria's capital assyria's final capital the city that is uh, mentioned many times in the bible plays a decisive role of course in the book of jonah is also elsewhere mentioned often in uh, second kings in particular um and becomes this last and greatest and most glamorous capital of Assyria. This is a, a photo I took in 2001 uh, from the main mound with the main palaces uh, looking towards the south. Um, here you can see, even though it's not a very elegant map, how large this city actually was. The wall is some 12 kilometers, so let's say eight to nine miles long, which is really, really, really big. Um, here are the main palaces on the main mount, uh, Southwest Palace of Sennacherib, the North Palace of Ashurbanipal. Um, and uh, the successors of Sennacherib continue to live in um, Nineveh, among them this uh, Sennacherib's son, Ashab, uh, Asahadon, here depicted together with his mother, who is another of these uh, female figures who were very, very influential. Uh, Nakia was probably more influential than her husband in some regards and clearly also interfered with politics. Um, under Asahadon, the Assyrians conquer for the first time uh, Egypt, and so this respect his reign uh, in geopolitical terms is a great success. Uh, but it's also, uh, for the first time, um, a reign when we see signs of trouble at home, uh, because in the very year when Assyrian armies far away um, conquer the city of Memphis and, and take over Egypt, in Asho itself, there are a number of rebellions against the king. One illuminated by this letter by an Assyrian informer that I published myself many years ago, a letter from the Yellow Babylonian collection, a very exciting letter about uh, the 
mayor of the city of Ashur engaging in a rebellion against the king. Uh, other rebellions took place in Nineveh and Haran, also very important cities of Assyria. So things are not quite right anymore, it seems. Asada manages to suppress those uh, rebellions, but still. Nonetheless, Asadan's son and successor, Ashurbanipal, whom I already mentioned earlier, um, under this Ashurbanipal, Assyria experienced uh, a last period of, you could argue, greatness. Um, it's uh, Ashurbanipal reconquers Egypt and, and certainly, in many regards, um, succeeds in, in a remarkable way, is also roots for a long period of time. But um, the claims by this king of being extremely successful in all sorts of ways but probably also not quite accurate that's at least an argument i'm making in the book an argument that some people might not agree with but what i would say is this yes uh, of course there's evidence for certain armies succeeding in their fights against uh, various enemies but those successes uh, some of them at least uh, well turn out to be pretty short-lived such as the attacks on the Elamites, they can depict, see depicted in this very elegant relief uh, from uh, Ashurbanipal's reign. And it's also important to take into account that while uh, Ashurbanipal claims in many of his inscriptions that he did join the army and so on, it's very clear that he didn't. Um, because in some inscriptions he does say that he didn't go to war. Instead, he would be sitting at home at Nineveh, um, making merry and, and, and uh, enjoying food and drink with his wife, as uh, this relief here shows. He's sitting here with his wife, Libali Sharad. And, well, his engagement with enemies was mostly kind of by watching them being tortured uh, in the city after they had been brought to him as prisoners. And even on this uh, putatively idyllic uh, scenery, you can see here on this very uh, image, when you look Closely, you can see on the left uh, the head of Ashurbanipal's favorite enemy, the Elamite king Tehoman, hanging down from a tree. Uh, so he contemplates that very head while uh, drinking and eating, uh, a not so pretty scene altogether. He also he may be compensate for the failure to uh, go to war. He, he, he claims to have been a great hunter. Again, this is also depicted on these very elegant reliefs from his north palace. But one can again question whether he really did the things that are depicted here. If I, for one, at least consider it extremely unlikely that he would approach, have approached a lion the way it's depicted uh, in the upper register of this relief. It would have been quite an unhealthy thing to do. So there's a disconnect here again between, um, well, the ideological claims the king makes and the actual reality that also pertains to Ashurbanipal. Um, saying that he enhanced his own economy. He claims there were lots of rains and the grain grew very, very high and there was an abundance of it. But we know from um, some past years that the Syrian megapluvialis period of, of, of increased rainfall was actually open, in which uh, actually there was very, very little rainfall. And so um, there's also some evidence that the economic situation actually slowly deteriorated under his reign. Finally, of course, what I already mentioned is the issue of Astrobanipal producing this very first universal library in the history of mankind, getting together all the cuneiform texts with literature and medicine and science and scholarship, whatever you wish. Uh, he could get hold of thousands and thousands of tablets. And we as modern scholars have to be extremely grateful for him for having done that because he, of course, helped uh, thus uh, to, well, have modern scholars to uncover all this, this whole um, Mesopotamian literature. Um, but then he claims that he himself was a great scholar. And again, that's simply not true because we have a few texts that seem to have been written by Ashurbanipal himself and they are written in a very clumsy hand, with mistakes and all that. And there are letters for him written by scholars in which they have to explain the most elementary things. So he also was not, as he claims, this great um, this this great uh, scholar. Now, you could, of course, argue, well, that's what kings do. They claim all sorts of things, but then we have to distinguish the body politic and the body natural, and, and of course, they don't. But the problem with Ashurbanipal is that, they, that he put all these claims to a series of public tests, and uh, in those, he probably would have failed before his subjects, especially the Assyrian elites, and this may have contributed to a slow weakening of the crown vis-a-vis uh, -vis the people. Be that as it may, it is at any rate not much after Ashurbanipal 
dies in 631, that the Assyrian Empire, so enormously powerful still in 650 or so, uh, comes to an abrupt end. The uh, exact events are known to a significant extent from a number of uh, sources. We're going to get into this here. You see a timeline. We can read more about this in my book. Uh, the main opponents who bring this fall of Assyria about are the Babylonians in the south uh, and an upstart kingdom, uh, namely that of the Medes, predecessors of the later Persians in the east. Together, they form a coalition, and in 612, uh, their troops conquer the city of Nineveh, thus essentially bringing the city of uh, the, 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 the state of Assyria really to an end. It's a dramatic event, very different. Uh, in many regards, the Assyrians were, in fact, quite like the Romans. Um, but it, when it comes to this end of Assyria, it's all quite different. The, the fall of the Roman Empire is a very long process. The uh, fall of Assyria is a, is a, is a short-term event. Uh, it happens when you, what you could call the First World War, because it's a dramatic thing with lots and lots of, of, of armies of different peoples involved. Um, here is a fanciful depiction of the last battle at Nineveh from 1829. It might not have been quite that bad, but it was bad enough. And archaeological evidence, for instance, from the gates of Nineveh shows the remains of the defenders of the city in these very last, last moments of its existence when they tried and failed to defend those gates against the, the intruding uh, Median and Babylonian armies. The um, conquerors... Um, eventually looted uh, Nineveh and then burned down the whole city, including the palaces. But before they did so, and it's also revealing, they defaced the um, <laughs> reliefs. They deliberately destroyed the faces of the Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, and also of his wife, as you can see. And they did this quite consistently, something that shows the hatred that uh, where the peoples who had previously been conquered and subjugated by the Assyrians must have had vis-a-vis -vis these Assyrians. And Probably that, too, is a reason why this uh, destruction of the Assyrian uh, kingdom was so radical. So cities like Nineveh and Kalach really come to an end at this time, never to, uh, essentially never, never, never to come back on their feet. Yeah. Um, but there's also a certain amount of continuity in cultural terms, if not uh, in terms of statehood or so. But especially in the city of Ashur, where everything began, Assyrian culture and especially Assyrian religion continue. This is a relief. Um, this 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 is a stealer, I should rather say, from uh, 12 or 13 AD. So some 600 years or so after the fall of Ashur uh, to the to the Medes and the Babylonians, um, and it's um, of a Parthian ruler of Ashur of that very time. Uh, a local leader, and it's very much in the Syrian style um, with the lunar crescent and uh, the, the the Venus star here on the right. Um, all that uh, is, is clearly drawing on earlier imperial Assyrian models. So it's not that Assyrian civilization, Assyrian culture, Assyrian religion comes to complete end. Even around 200, there were still people in Asher who would worship the god Asher and his wife Sheruah and would actually sacrifice to these deities on the same festival days that were already um, well in place in the imperial period in the 7th century BC or so. In late antiquity, um, the city of Arbela might still have been a place where Assyrian civilization continued since this has been continuously ex uh, settled. <laughs> it's not really possible to excavate the earlier layers. The kingdom of Adiabene um, was a sort of successor kingdom of Assyria, and sometimes this Assyria is actually called Assyria, but slowly but steadily, Assyrian sites really are lost, and uh, the memory of 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 um, well the um, the earlier traditions is 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 slowly decreasing, and and uh, then for for hundreds of years uh, is is largely lost. Then, though, in the nineteenth century, and here I'm coming to the end. Um, in the nineteenth century, um, in this in this time when when European historicism combined with of course with Assyrian it was with European uh, imperialism leads to a renewed interest in the history of of the of the ancient Near East uh, British and French excavators eventually also Americans begin to excavate and unearth sites in uh, Assyria including in Nineveh and Kahu where they find the texts uh, but also the uh, well, the monumental art, and here you can see 
how the British um, under uh, so, so under Layard and you know, those those early pioneers of excavating those sites, uh, how they move uh, bull colossus, um, which are a really easy thing to do, and essentially the Assyrians did it in very similar ways to the river, where it was then shipped down to the Persian Gulf and brought to the British Museum uh, uh, to be installed in that museum uh, in the early 1850s. Um, this um, interest of the West in the Syrian civilization, the expanse of, of um, local investment in um, in scholarship on that very history, has led probably to a certain degree to an alienation of the of the local people of Iraq when it comes to this very ancient history that has contributed, even though it's certainly not alone responsible for the destruction of the Syrian sites in Iraq. Um, under ISIS, of which I'm sure uh, many of you are aware, between 2014 and 2017, the Islamic State uh, group uh, controlled uh, the area around Mosul, which is the core area of Assyrian civilization, and at some point began to deliberately demolish uh, many of the sites of the Assyrian sites. Uh, of course, a very, very sad um, series of events. You see some of the uh, destruction brought by this year depicted on these photos. Um, and uh, highly, uh, yeah, dispiriting, of course, for all sorts of reasons. But at the same time, fortunately, 2017, this reign of terror came to an end. Uh, and uh, remarkably soon after ISIS was gone, um, scholars again began to excavate at some of these sites. In fact, were the destruction uh, produced by ISIS, for instance, at a site in Nineveh called Nebi Yunus, where a mosque dedicated to the prophet Jonah was destroyed by ISIS, enabled archaeologists for the first time to excavate underneath that very mosque and to uncover an, uh, had his, up to then unknown palace of the Israeli king Asahadon. We can see here the team from Heidelberg University and the, the directorship of Peter Miglos excavating in the throne room of Asahadon, where you have two thrones, one on the right, one on the left, and one wonders whether well, one was clearly that of Asahadon, but whether the other throne was that of Queen Nakia, Asahadon's mother, or that of his son, Ashurbanipal. At any rate, uh, research on Israel continues, um, which is exciting and uh, will continue in the future, of course. And well, what I've tried in my book to give an up-to-date, um, well, introduction to what I think is a really important and exciting moment in human history, history of Assyria. It's quite clear, of course, also that, let's say, in 10 or 20 years, when such a book is, 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 is written by someone else, we'll know a great deal more. But that's only part why why it is exciting to study ancient history. Things things change and, <laughs> yeah. Um, and and uh, the new questions we'll be asking in the future, of course, will also force us to some extent to revise our opinion or our, our view of Syria. Uh, I've given you here uh, my take on it uh, in a nutshell uh, in, in some 50 minutes or so. It's a very, very short time uh, to cover uh, these 2000 years or so. But I hope that you've gotten a certain idea why it's exciting to study Syria and actually also somewhat entertaining in, in certain moments. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for for your attention.